height. Increasingly, the training I do is on glass primary flight displays or PFTs. And I've noticed that quite a high proportion of even quite experienced pilots have little idea about two indicators that dramatically reduce workload, the track pointer and the flight path marker. The former is on almost all glass HSIs. It has different names in different products, but I'm just going to call it the track pointer. Sadly, it's absent from some early G1000 implementations, which is remarkable as it must be the easiest thing to program in. The flight path marker, sometimes called the flight path vector, is only present with synthetic vision, but is then extremely useful as you can put the aircraft on the desired trajectory horizontally and vertically. So let's start with the track pointer. It is an indication of the magnetic track the aircraft is flying. This is the actual track made good and differs from the heading by the drift. It's at its most useful when tracking, particularly tracking the final approach whether ILS, RMP, or NDB. Tracking a course, whether RNAV, VOR, or single needle, and outbound in the hold. People get confused about which way to turn to make it move, but a moment's thought will tell you that if you want your track to go right, you have to turn right and vice versa. I guess that the confusion comes from the heading bug, where it appears to turn in the opposite direction to the turn. If the heading bug is to your left and you turn left, it appears to turn to the right to meet you. But the track pointer is completely different from the heading bug. You set the heading bug to provide reference for the heading you want to fly. And you could say that it's a command instrument. The track pointer simply tells you the track you're achieving. It is, you could say, a performance instrument. To save confusion, in some circumstances, I suggest to students they move the heading bug out of the way and just place the track pointer where they want to go. This would include on final approach. Let's take that as our first example of the usefulness of the track pointer. The first point to make is that the, if the deviation bar is in the middle and you place the track pointer on the end of the course pointer, you can only stay on the final approach track. This is regardless of drift. The actual track being flown is the track of the final approach, so you cannot go off the center line. If there's any deviation shown on the deviation bar, then placing the track pointer on the same side of the course pointer as the bar can only make things better. The speed with which the bar corrects the middle will, of course, depend on the intercept angle, that is to say, the number of degrees between the course pointer and the track pointer and the sensitivity, which means the distance to the threshold on the approach, or the sensitivity when en route. A really good rule of thumb is to place the tip of the deviation bar on an imaginary line from the track pointer to the center of the instrument. This is so valuable that some HSIs have that line drawn, as you can see here on the G5. But if it's not present, you can imagine it. What you really want to avoid is for the track pointer to be on the other side of the course pointer from the deviation bar. In that circumstance, the deviation will only get worse. Any student of mine will hear a constant mantra from me of put the track pointer on the same side of the course pointer as the deviation bar. If I were given even a small coin every time I said that, I'd be a wealthy man. The track pointer works equally well when using single needle tracking, whether in the hold, on the approach, or en route. Just establish the track you want on the needle, turn to place the track pointer on the tip or tail of the needle, and you can only remain on track. This is good outbound in the hold join and inbound in the hold. Also, if you've watched my tracking video, you'll have heard me say that the head of the needle always falls to the tail of the aircraft. The truth is that it actually falls away from the track, not from the heading. So the track pointer also helps sort out interception of a single needle track. The second great use for the track pointer is where you need to follow a track in a procedure. For example, in the departure VFR and IFR from runway 21 at Biggin Hill, or this alternate missed approach at LID, the instruction is to follow a track without guidance 
And the track pointer makes that trivial. You just turn onto the desired track and need think no more. And the last use of the track pointer is my favorite. As far as I know, this was invented by my friend Henry Hunter during a lesson when I was teaching him holding, and I now teach it to everyone as the Henry Hunter technique. We all know that outbound in the hold, we need to triple the single drift. So we need to know that single drift. I teach that without a track pointer, you should determine the single drift in the hold join, outbound in the parallel join and inbound in the teardrop. But unless a direct join is close enough to the axis to fly along it, there's no way to measure it. But with a track pointer, you don't need any of that. You just fly the outbound leg, point the nose into the wind, and then fly a heading that places the track pointer one third of the way between the heading and the outbound track. You know the outbound track because you've set the course pointer on the inbound track so you can use the tail end of the course pointer. The use of the one third, two third means that the single drift is between the heading and the track. That's the definition of single drift. And you want three times that. So you put twice as much drift the other side, meaning a total of three times the single drift, which is what you need on the outbound leg. So there you have it with the track pointer, an invaluable tool for tracking approaches and holds. Let's move on to another wonderful feature, which comes with synthetic vision the flight path marker or vector. Simply put, this tells you where you're going in three dimensions, so you can put it where you want to go, both horizontally and vertically, and the aircraft will follow. It's worth clarifying that this isn't like the flight director. It doesn't need anything programmed into the navigator to make it work. It's also independent of navigation aids and the GPS VLOC navigator mode. There are two big applications. The first is to remain level in turns, particularly steep turns. If you keep the flight path vector on the white horizon line, and do remember to use that horizon line, not the depicted synthetic vision interface between surface and sky, then you cannot go up or down. This is much more responsive and immediate indication than the altimeter ribbon. The second great use is on the final approach, particularly if you have no vertical guidance. Providing that you start at the final approach pixel point at the correct altitude, if you then place the flight path marker in the touchdown zone, the aircraft must be exactly on the center line and glide path. You're just playing a video game of keeping the sights on the target. Obviously, you still need to check the indications from the approach aid and to check the check altitudes, but that's made trivial with the flight path vector. My experience is of students doing perfect approaches from the first attempt using the support of the flight path vector. Let's just watch the same thing without vertical guidance. It takes you straight to the touchdown point in the simplest possible way. However, of course, an IR examiner may insist on raw data, so the student must be trained on that in case. That's it for this very short video. I hope it was helpful. See you in the next one.